this session on state of the science, I'm going to talk to you about the role of biomedical research in our approach to the control of TB in general and MDR and XDR TB in particular. But before I get into any detail on the subject, I'd like to frame this issue in the broader context. And I know from the beginning, but both my own personal experience and discussions with so many of my colleagues in this area, that there are some positive and negative aspects to talking about this in a broad big picture of biomedical research. And the reason is that MDR and XDR-TB are such devastating problems in and of themselves that they need special specific attention and they need it right now. Yet there's always the fear that if you address these, TB in general, that is, rather than MDR and XDR right away specifically, you might be construed as suggesting a dilution of the effort. And even worse, if you put TB in the context of global health as a broad subject, that you might be diluting the discussion and the effort even further. And I have to tell you, I really do not believe that this is the case. In fact, when it comes to the research pathway to TB control, I believe that it is beneficial, if not necessary, to think in the broader context, particularly in the broader context of global health. And I'm going to address this in more detail in a moment. So it has become clear to me during the 25 years that I've been the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at NIH that one cannot study global health without also addressing infectious diseases, even though we all know there are many more things about global health than just infectious diseases. And one cannot address infectious diseases in the context of global health without addressing tuberculosis, one of the great killers. Importantly, one cannot adequately address any of these issues without a robust toolkit of healthcare therapies, of healthcare interventions. And you cannot have that robust toolkit without biomedical research. And by the toolkit is what we were speaking about last night and we'll hear more about today, diagnostics, therapies, and vaccines. And so I am here this morning to speak with you about the role of biomedical research in addressing the complex, heterogeneous, sometimes frustrating, but always challenging problem of tuberculosis control. To put the recent history of TB research into some context, I will relate to you an amazing fact. One can say that given the seriousness of the global TB problem, this is unbelievable. Unbelievable, but true. At the time that I assumed the directorship of NIAID in fiscal year 1985, the budget for all of NIAID was approximately $300 million. The amount that we were spending annually for TB research was $665,000. Even in today's dollars, that would barely be enough to sustain one laboratory. That incredibly low figure was a reflection of several confluent factors. First, TB incidents had been declining rapidly in the United States on a linear slope that actually predicted virtual disappearance within a few years. Second, despite the fact that TB was still rampant throughout the world, we in the United States, and I'm not speaking for other developed nations, but I'm sure it was similar, we in the United States sparingly looked beyond our own borders in our research investments, and we were not very heavily invested in global health. We had curative drugs for TB, a skin test, and sputum for diagnosis, and we did not really need a vaccine, at least not in the United States. It is no wonder that there was no incentive for bright young researchers to pursue a career in TB research. Unfortunately, the consequences have been devastating from the standpoint of lost opportunities in biomedical research. Generations of research advances and technologies have literally bypassed the field of TB research. As this audience knows well, TB is an ancient disease that has in the past and continues to claim millions and millions of lives. 
As we all know, and we've said it so many times, one-third of the world's population is thought to be infected with MTB, and more than 9 million people develop active disease each year. Yet, what interventional tools do we have at our disposal? We all know BCG vaccine is nearly a century old and is not effective against pulmonary TB, which is the most important form of TB, with regard to the burden of disease transmission. There have been no newly licensed drug for TB in decades. We heard that last night. And our therapeutic regimens are cumbersome, prone to development of resistance. Now, in fairness, recently, new drugs have come online but they have resulted only in incremental changes. We've treated TB patients almost the same for the past 60 years and have not really changed the basic therapeutic regimen. As we all know, our diagnostics are antiquated, non-standardized, and imprecise. Now, I must say at this point that it is true that much can and has been accomplished by the application of the control methods that we already have available to us and others are gonna address this important work later in the program. However, we must have better tools for the toolkit. So I ask the question, why are we in the state that we are in right now? Why are not so many more people angry? Where, for example, is the large cadre of TB activists that have been seen in HIV AIDS? So let's turn to that for a moment. As some of you may know, I have been involved in the field of HIV AIDS research from the very first reports of this disease 28 years ago, almost to this day. Remember the CDC's MMWR that reported the first five cases of gay men in Los Angeles with pneumocystis pneumonia was published on June 5th of 1981. There are some lessons to be learned from the response of the community to the need for basic and applied research to provide the appropriate tools to address what was at the time a new, mysterious, and thoroughly frightening disease. The activists were predominantly patients, their friends and loved ones. I got to know almost all of them. People who felt that they were at risk for infection and what was then an ultimate death sentence. The passion of their advocacy was palpable and extremely effective. In addition, and this is important, AIDS first became apparent in the developed world, which was rich in resources and fearful that this new disease was predominantly their problem. Only after a decade did it become clear that HIV AIDS was a disease predominantly of poor countries. Today we know now that more than 90% of infections occur in low and middle income countries and two thirds in Southern Africa. But by the time HIV was recognized as truly a global pandemic, the momentum for a robust AIDS research agenda had already been launched. The results, particularly in the arena of therapeutics, have been breathtaking. More than 10% of the NIH's $30 billion budget is devoted to AIDS research. Despite the fact that the AIDS pandemic still rages, the fruits, particularly of therapeutic research, have been profound and transformative. There are about 30 FDA licensed drugs for HIV AIDS that have enormously improved the lives of infected people who can access them, even though the drugs are not yet curative. All of this has happened in a relatively short period of time when you put it against the backdrop of the history of TB.